welcome to this panel discussion about uh, economic development and the future of economic development in the region. Um, uh, I will have the pleasure of um, serving as a moderator for this panel uh, and most importantly for this outstanding group of individuals. Uh, our first panelist is Mr. Richard Dale, President and CEO of the Greater El Paso Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Dale uh, began his career in the Chamber world in 2003 as Chief Operating Officer. In 2004, he assumed the position of President and was selected to be the Chamber President and CEO in 2007. In his prior career, he was the President and CEO of a large travel company for nearly 30 years. During those years, he transformed a small local operation of 10 employees into a company with 10 offices in four states with more than 100 employees. Through his career, Mr. Dale has served on several boards and committees. He graduated from uh, the Institute for Organizational Management at the University of Arizona in 2009 and received his Chamber Executive designation in August of this year. Mr. Dale also attend, uh, attended UTEP majoring in speech and, and theater studies and, receive, and, and recently returned uh, to complete his work in inter interdisciplinary studies. Mr. Dale is also an Air Force veteran who served in Vietnam. Please help me welcome Mr. Richard Dale. Our next panelist is Mr. Matthew McElroy, Director of the City of El Paso Development Department, where he oversees the planning, building permits, and inspections, as well as the development one-stop divisions. He also serves on the National Board for the Congress for the New Urbanism, or CNU. In addition of growing its local membership for, for CNU, Mr. McElroy trains and speak to department heads, managers, engineers, and architects to pass the CNU professional accreditation exam all over the country. Not surprisingly, he was the 2012 winner of the group's award, one of the highest national honors for leadership in the field of planning. Prior, prior to joining the city of El Paso, Mr. McElroy served as Associate Director of the Institute for Policy and Economic Development at UTEP, where he oversaw all research operations. Also, in this capacity, he co-led a team that won the National Award for Excellence in Policy Analysis for the Council for Community and Economic Research. Mr. McElroy received a Bachelor of Arts in English, a Master's of Public Administration, and a Master's of Science in Economics, all three from UTEP. Please help me welcome Mr. Micro. We also have the privilege uh, of counting with the presence of Colonel Thomas Munsey, Munsey uh, Garrison Commander at Fort Bliss. Upon graduation from East Tennessee mm. State University, mm. he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the field artillery. While assigned there, he served as a company fire support officer, battery fire detection officer, battery executive officer, and battalion fire direction officer. He was then assigned to 1st Battalion, 5th Field Artillery in the 1st Brigade, 1st Infantry Division at Fort Raleigh, Kansas. He was also assigned to the National Training Center at Fort Irving, California, and to headquarters United States Army Forces Command at Fort McPherson, Georgia. Colonel Munsey was also assigned at the, at the Republic of Korea and deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He became the Brigade uh, Effects Coordinator and then the Brigade Deputy Commanding Officer in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Colonel Munsey attended the Field Artillery Officers Basic and Advanced Courses at the Air Command and Staff College and the U.S. Army War College. Please help me welcome Colonel Munsey. Uh, 
And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Rolando Pablos, CEO of the Borderplex Alliance, where he oversees a unified binational effort to foster comprehensive regional economic development, cooperation, and collaboration within West Texas, Southern New Mexico, and Northern Chihuahua. Prior to his arrival at the Borderplex Alliance, Mr. Pablo served on the Public Utility Commission of Texas, regulating, regulating the state's electric and telecommunication utilities, and had a primary jurisdiction over activities conducted by the uh, Electric Reliability Council of Texas. Mr. Pablos has also served as chairman of the Texas Racing Commission, the Free Trade Alliance, and the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. After obtaining his bachelor's from St. Mary's University, Mr. Pablos earned an MBA from the University of Texas at San Antonio and a master's of hospita hospitality management from the University of Houston. Subsequently, Mr. Pablos earned his Juris Doctor degree from St. Mary's University School of Law. Please help me welcome again, Mr. Paulus. Okay, uh, I would like to first start with uh, an overall introduction, uh, perhaps if, let's start with, with you, Mr. Paulus, uh, and, and if you can tell us uh, an overall view of, of what you do at the Borderplex and, and perhaps some of the complex uh, issues that you're facing uh, in the region in terms of economic development. Sounds good, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, hosting us today. Thank you to the El Paso Community College and everybody who was responsible for putting this great event together. Very successful and thank you for being here. Uh, at the Borderplex Alliance, uh, you know, our job is to uh, bring the region together. Uh, we live in an environment where we have a, in an international boundary, we have state lines. Um, we have one economy and yet we struggle to work together uh, to promote ourselves as one. And so uh, our main job is to do just that, and that is to uh, bring Ciudad Juarez, Southern New Mexico, and El Paso together, uh, promote the region as one, um, try to identify those challenges that we have in common and try to tackle those together, try to identify the opportunities and, and those assets that we have that we can leverage as a region. And so. Uh, we've been working really hard with uh, each part of the region to ensure that we increase our competitiveness, uh, making ourselves attractive uh, to investment, uh, to the companies and organizations that are already here, uh, ensuring that um, we uh, put it on our best face forward so that uh, when other regions are competing for the same investment, uh, we come out ahead. And so, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that's what we do. Uh, the struggle is, in fact, uh, bringing the region together, uh, convincing people from throughout the region that if we work together, uh, we would be better off. You know, um, other regions, uh, particularly in the United States, such as Denver and Phoenix and San Antonio, Austin, you know, they tend to work together. They tend to um, bring the, the community um, into the fold in their economic development efforts. And so that's what we're trying to do here in spite of the fact that we have these political boundaries that uh, have traditionally divided us. And so the challenge here is to uh, help erase those boundaries, uh, break the silos, uh, and ensure that as we uh, look as, uh, forward as a region uh, that we um, uh, can promote ourselves and bring that investment that is sorely needed. Very well, very well. Uh, Mr. Dale, uh, you probably do a, a similar role in terms of uh, fostering economic development more, I guess, at a local level. Could you uh, explain what you do at the chamber and, and all the, the um, I guess, the challenges that, that you have and the challenges that your stakeholders have currently have and how sure. can we overcome those challenges? Yeah. Uh, first of all, just for a slight correction, we actually don't do what the Borderplex does. Uh, in fact, by design, we don't. Our role is more of an advocacy role in the community. Uh, we deal with issues that relate to our community, both the city level, the county level, state level in Austin, and in DC. And so we advocate on behalf of the community uh, addressing issues that we think uh, need to be addressed in terms of creating a culture and an atmosphere that's conducive for economic development 
to help him with what he's doing, which is the recruitment of industry and the coalition of communities together. So our part really is to complement what they're doing, and their part is to complement what we're doing, uh, just for clarification purposes. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, if you ask uh, anywhere across the country a chamber CEO, what is it uh, that you do in chambers of commerce? There is no elevator speech for that, uh, unless you're on the Empire State Building, because it just takes so long. So the short answer is, we really try to develop, uh, in, in our, our chamber in particular, um, leadership qualities among the, the uh, future leaders of our community. We have a lot of communities that work together to address issues in education, transportation, things of that nature. And of course, we work very closely with, with the military and most closely, I guess, uh, of all the government en entities with our city. I think that's probably the closest relationship we have. In terms of challenges, um, uh, you can't do what we all do for a living and not be an optimist <laughs> unless you just you know, like to be self-abusive. Uh, but I would say that for the most part, uh, there are a lot of good things happening in our community, in our region. Uh, the single biggest challenge that comes to my mind is that we have a, a serious challenge with taxes, property taxes especially. And that has been, and we're trying very hard to mitigate uh, it being the continued um, obstacle for growth in our community. Thank you, thank you very well. Uh, Mr. McElroy, uh, could you please uh, tell us an overall picture of, of what your department does, how are you helping uh, the, the local economy and, and the development of, uh, and, and improvement of the quality of life uh, in the region? Sure, um, thank you for, for having us. I think that the best way to explain what the city development department does within the, within the larger framework of, of city government is that we are, everybody that you see here, Richard, Rolando, Fort Bliss, um, everybody plays on the same economic development team. And so when, if it's a company that's looking to relocate to the El Paso region, um, a lot of their interaction happens with the border plex. Every company that's looking to relocate to El Paso has development challenges. Where are they going to build? What's the permitting process? How fast can they build to get their product to market? Or how fast can they hire people to provide whatever service it is that they're going to provide? We work with them on an expedited permitting process so they can get built and operational because that's critical to economic development as well. We also work with a number, another member of our team, Carrie Weston, who actually works in, with um, the department that we call in, um, um, economic and international affairs and so that's another member of the team who makes sure that that company gets everything it needs when it comes here and then when that company is here a lot of the advocacy and relationship with the larger business community happens with the greater chamber and so um, the city of El Paso is just one portion of that team to make sure that we're as competitive as we can be as as we try to recruit those companies to come to El Paso, to make it fast, to make it easy, to make them feel welcome, or to help companies expand here, everybody that you see up here works on that as well. Great, great. Colonel Munsey, uh, could you please uh, tell us uh, about the current or the past recent changes in, in terms of Fort Bliss, in terms of all the investment Definitely Fort Bliss wa was one of the uh, economic drivers in our region, thanks to all the uh, soldiers that, that were housed or are uh, housed at Fort Bliss and, and stationed at Fort Bliss. Can you tell us more about, about that, a little bit of data in terms of the investment, all the construction, all the population that is uh, there at Fort Bliss? Yes, and uh, good evening, everyone. And, and it's a pleasure being here uh, with, with my colleagues this evening. Um, Fort Bliss, uh, since 2007, with the base realignment and closure, com closure commission, um, Fort Bliss and El Paso benefited greatly from that for a variety of reasons, uh, of which Fort Bliss is one of the best places in the world in which uh, Army units can train. So what, what Fort Bliss realized over the last uh, seven to eight years, it tripled in size in terms of soldier population. So in 2007, the active duty soldier population of Fort Bliss was about 9,500. 
Today, we have 35,000 soldiers training on Fort Bliss, uh, of which just under 30,000 are full-time uh, soldiers stationed on Fort Bliss. We typically have on a daily basis about 4,500 Reserve, National Guard, and Air Force, other services, training on Fort Bliss. Additionally, we have about 12,000 civilian employees on the installation on any given day, and that's a combination of Department of the Army civilians and contract uh, employees providing a variety of functions for, the, for us. Uh, annually, or, or since the expansion, uh, Fort Bliss contributes about five and a half billion dollars uh, in, into the economy here. I'm not saying that it all stays locally, but uh, when, when you look at the compensation from all of the soldiers, the civilians, family members, uh, contractors, you know, that, that's, that's the number we get to. To include um, retirees and veterans are in the, in the area and, and still receive a compensation from uh, from, from the federal government to some certain degree. You specifically mentioned uh, cons military construction. The, uh, just this past year, we had about 148,000, or I'm sorry, $148 million worth of construction projects I in some state um, on, on Fort Bliss. Again, not all of that stays locally, however, much of it does, particularly in terms of uh, labor costs that, uh, that these companies provide. So over the last seven to eight years, we've seen a substantial growth in, in the uh, active duty civilian workforce and families that, that uh, accompany these soldiers here, as well as increased uh, contribution to the local economy. Uh, regarding that, I kind of have a follow-up question in terms of the family members. Uh, do you, can you uh, provide like a percentage of, of the family members of, of soldiers that are actually here versus the ones that are still at their hometowns? Yes. Because uh, obviously that's, that's a huge impact in terms of economic development. And, and Fort Bliss is pretty much right in line with the Army in terms of 55% uh, of the soldiers on Fort Bliss are married and the majority have their families here. And I will tell you, the, the spouses of our service members are, are great. Uh, that, that's a great talent pool from which to draw from for employment locally. And uh, that number is somewhere around 30,000. But that, that includes children as well. Um, on any given day, we have about 75,000 people living on Fort Bliss. That's soldiers, uh, civilian workforce uh, employees, and then family members living on the installation. Thank you, thank you. Very good information. Uh, uh, I would like to continue, and, and this question is for, for everyone that would like to, add, uh, to respond. And, and it's based on what would you say uh, are the main drivers of economic development here in, in the region? Well, you know, I, I, before I answer that, what I'd like to talk about is what is it that organizations like the military or, or businesses look for whenever they're coming to a region and evaluating it to see if uh, this is a place where they like to be. And so, just like any of us, they look for a good quality of life. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, there are good schools for families, uh, places to entertain themselves, uh, good restaurants, all those things that we look for uh, as families. Uh, that is very important. We also look at quality of place. They want to make sure that we have good government, that we don't have over taxation. They want to make sure that we have good roads, that we have good utilities, uh, affordable, reliable electricity, ample water supplies, good broadband, uh, good public transportation. Those are very important items uh, when companies and the military are looking for places to either arrive or stay. Uh, also, uh, quality of industry. They want to make sure that there's a good supplier base, that there, there's a good small business base, access to capital so that those small businesses can provide those services that these companies will need. And, and lastly, uh, but definitely not least, with, and it's actually the most important, is quality of workforce. So companies want to make sure that they come to an area where they'll, they will have uh, a quality workforce. They'll have 
a good supply of qualified individuals who can work at their uh, establishments. And so for those of you who are studying and getting your degrees, I congratulate you because you're adding to that base of quality uh, in workforce. We need a, a talent, talented pipeline of workers and individuals who will uh, satisfy the needs of those companies. And so those companies that are looking at our region uh, are coming here, uh, many of them come here for manufacturing. Uh, a lot of them come here to service other organizations like the military, uh, like the manufacturing base itself. Uh, medical uh, is extremely important, uh, academic education. Uh, high tech, uh, logistics. So those are the areas that uh, uh, you know uh, we have to offer. But at the same time, uh, we need to develop other areas of expertise so that we can uh, begin to have a, a well balanced uh, industry base. And uh, at the Borderplex, what we're trying to do right now is to exactly do that: is to identify what industries we ought to target and go after uh, and put all of our might into it, so that we can then go out and sell. Uh, not only uh, the base, but also uh, the workforce itself. Great, great. Uh, well, certainly uh, education, workforce development are, are one of the, I will consider one of the main drivers for economic development. Uh, Mr. Deo, what, what do you think about that and what have you uh, hear from businesses about what, what's the stage uh, of or uh, current uh, education, uh, workforce development, are we okay? What do we need to improve? Well, what you, are the needs, in other words, of businesses locally? Well, you, you used the word, are we okay, or the phrase, are we okay? And I think Rolando touched on that uh, quite well. Um, I guess the short answer is yes, we're okay, but okay is not quite good enough. Uh, Rolando mentioned the importance of you all finishing your education. Hopefully you want to also get your four-year degrees uh, where, where it's applicable. Uh, we have one of the best workforce in the country uh, in terms of work ethic. Uh, we, in fact, they just recently announced ADP is doubling their size in El Paso, 1,100 employees to 2,200. And one of the reasons that ADP gave for that expansion is their experience here has been so exceptional, so positive. They had a choice, I believe the mayor quoted, uh, ADP director here, he had a choice between Augusta, Georgia and El Paso, and he chose ultimately El Paso because of our workforce. We have a lot to be proud of here, and we have a very good work ethic. What we are lacking are some of the skill sets for the higher paying positions, uh, those, those jobs that require four-year degrees. Uh, we don't have enough of, a, of a, su a supply line, if you will, at this point. Uh, we have lost a lot of our young talent over the last two decades migrating out of our community after they graduate because this is the other side of that. We haven't had the job opportunities here for them to pay them well enough. So engineers graduating and moving away. That is starting to reverse, which we're very happy to say. We're starting to see those folks returning back to El Paso, missing living here, and now with job opportunities being created have a chance to come back here. I'll hand that off to Matthew. It, it, that's an excellent staging point to talk about, um, especially here when I see you know a room full of students from community college. When we just came back from Nashville and they were talking about they're able to retain something like 60% of their college graduates from people who go to college in Nashville in different places. Phenomenal number. But the reason that that happens in America today is because we are in a nationwide, a frankly, a global competition for talent. And if you're going to be successful in that competition for talent, the whole world is changing in terms of what people your age are asking for. If you look at what millennials are asking for in, 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 in today's world, millennials, and that's 20-ish to 34 to 36-ish, the definition is kind of fuzzy, but it's people in roughly your age group. Over 60% of those people will choose first where they want to live, and then they're going to find a job. And so 
economic development in terms of building a quality workforce, that's part of it, but you have to give them a reason to stay or a reason to come back. So your population is, is going to look first for where you want to live, and then you're going to find a job. After that, the interesting thing is, if, is if you're a college-educated millennial, over 70% of college-educated millennials want to live in America's urban core or urban cores in dense places, in mixed-use places. It's not me making it up. It's the Brookings Institute. The Brookings Institute is the one who did all of this research. Keep in mind that with that, you, you also have a hundred, over 100 million new households being formed in the, in the United States by 2025. 80% of those households will be childless. So if you want to be a city that is built for that coming population, you have to build yourself a different built environment over time. That population bump is demanding a different kind of, 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 of product. They want a vibrant downtown. They want mixed use places. They want to be multimodal. They want to be able to take trolleys. They want to be able to take bus rapid transit. They still want to have access to automobiles. But they want all of those things that if you're not building those things as a, as a city, you're not going to be successful in attracting that talent. And that's just the reality. The other thing that as a city we need to keep in mind is that we're an automobile city. It's great. No problem with an automobile city. Americans are not giving up their cars anytime soon. And, I, and I'm not naive enough to think that that's going to happen. But what, you, what we do need to begin to do is think about how it is we become more multimodal because the tax problem is an automobile problem. If you look at what you get in terms of value per acre in urban development, and I'm talking about down